Well, we are in Nehemiah 5 this morning, if you'll turn there with me. I was thinking yesterday about our commitment to expositional preaching, that is just preaching through books of the Bible, kind of systematically, section by section, as it were. And it occurred to me that if instead our pattern were to write sermons that address sort of cultural topics, you know, each week, what's going on in our culture, we really would have no idea even where to start between the Olympics and a violently contentious presidential race, devastating global conflicts, natural disasters, and an unpredictable economy, among other concerns, we would be constantly shifting gears trying to address what appears to be the most pressing cultural bugaboo at the moment. And what it would result in, as a friend of mine says, is kind of a whack-a-mole approach to preaching, where each week you're just trying to hammer down all the cultural issues that keep popping up throughout the week. Um, well, the beautiful thing that we're going to see today, and we've seen, you know, we see throughout sermon series, is that when we faithfully march through the scriptures and we open up the text and we say, here reads the word of the Lord, um, the Holy Spirit in a very unique way, in a very profound way, uh, drives the agenda and speaks to, through the word, what we're facing uh, in our families and, and in our society. So not only do we keep the text in the context and hopefully rightly understand it, but we also uh, allow the, the Holy Spirit is the one who is driving the agenda. So this, this morning, we're going to answer, hopefully address three questions from the text. Number one, with all the things going on in our world, how can the church maintain her witness in this world? Uh, number two, how can you have an impact for Christ in your particular world or your sphere of influence? And three, with so much hatred being thrown around in every direction, why even try to be a witness? Why not just keep our heads down and our mouths shut and not say anything? So how can the church uh, maintain her witness in the world? How can you uh, have a witness in your particular sphere? And then why would we even try to have an influence? So we wrapped up last week. Uh, Craig did, one of our elders, did a terrific job. And when we came to the end of the text, Nehemiah and the people of Israel were working hard to build the, to build the wall of Jerusalem. And they were working together. They were unified. They, they were on guard. They had their weapons at their respective sides. And so they were, they were looking around. They were staying alert. But they were very busy uh, at the task in hand. They, they kept going from sunup until sundown, uh, going nonstop, which is the sort of effort that would be necessary to finish this, you know, seemingly insurmountable task. But now, though, this morning, we see Nehemiah calling people off the wall for a, what we might even call a, a congregational meeting of sorts to address a crisis in the community. Well, what could be so important that Nehemiah would pause the work on the wall in order to have this meeting? So the story will unfold kind of in three stanzas. First of all, we see a crisis. Secondly, we see an appeal and then third, we're going to see an example, actually Nehemiah's personal example. So we'll cover all of chapter five this morning. Uh, let me start by reading verses one through five. Here reads the word of the Lord. Now there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. For there were those who said, with our sons and our daughters, we are many. So let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. There were also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. And there were those who said, we borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, and our children are as their children. Yet we are, we are forcing our sons and daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have already been enslaved. But it is not in our power to help it. For other men have our fields and our vineyards. So this section begins with this phrase, there was a great outcry. And when we read such language in the scripture, what tends to follow is an announcement of an attack by a surrounding nation. So this is the kind of language that usually goes along with uh, 
an attack by a neighboring nation. So there would be a great outcry. Uh, there would be people would rally together and they would recognize that the, the, the nations are encroaching with very bad intentions. Um, but that's not the case here. Actually, what's going on here is the outcry rings out from men and their wives, we're told, within the camp, actually directed internally at their brothers. So here's what was going on. The building of the wall to Jerusalem, which we've looked at the past uh, couple of weeks, was an all-hands-on-deck project. It was an all-consuming job that required the involvement of everyone from the highest in position to just the ordinary uh, servants. And a project this big naturally affected the economy of the entire community. So people who, people who earned a living as merchants, that is to say they were perfumers. We, we saw they were in the list. Um, they were goldsmiths, for example. They were unable to do their jobs. They were unable to buy and sell their products because they were so busy working on the wall. So they had to set aside their business endeavors to go to this work on this community project. Again, people who normally sold perfume in order to provide for their families, they couldn't sell their fragrances. They couldn't buy fragrances to sell because they were tied up at the wall. And this meant that there were plenty of hardworking people who were, who were not making any money at all. Now, the people who had money, they were fine. They were actually getting richer off of this building project by lending money to the workers at very high interest rates. And many of the people working in the wall had had enough. So there, you saw this when I read, there were three kind of groups of protesters that come to Nehemiah. The first group was the aforementioned merchants who said, look, we don't have any, we don't have any time to do our business. We, we can't run our business, so we're starving here. So that was the first group. The second group is made up of people who were landowners in Jerusalem who had to abandon their farms to go work on the wall. So there's no harvest, meaning there's no food to feed their families. There's no food to sell. And so there's, as I just read, there's a famine in the land. And this group, in order to survive, has mortgaged their land in order to borrow money to live, and they're risking their farms and really their livelihood in order to survive. Uh, when I was a pastor in Valparaiso, Indiana, we had a family who was the, the largest provider of tomatoes for the Red Gold uh, Tomato Company. And they would have very brief stretches during the winter where they didn't have anything to do. So, you know, they were all the whole family, the whole family was involved in this business, you know, from grandparents to parents to kids and so on. And, and they would have a lot of free time to help during a very small stretch of time during the winter. But then when uh, it was time for the harvest, they would work 18, 20 hour days, kind of, you know, bringing in the tomatoes. Well, the farmers in Jerusalem who are protesting to Nehemiah, they're working on the wall, so they don't have time. They're not able to plant seeds. They're not able to reap a harvest. And so there was nothing to collect. There was nothing to eat. There was nothing to sell. And they are in dire straits financially. Now, the third group also consisted of farmers. But these farmers had borrowed money to pay the imperial taxes, and they were falling into this incredible debt, really a debt they had no ability to repay. And that was so bad that it forced some of them to sell their own children into slavery. I mean, can you even imagine? I mean, the grief and the pain and the agony. They're so poor, they have to sell their own children to slavery. So you have a group of Jewish people struggling to the point of near starvation, being forced to sell some of their own children into slavery, while other Jewish brothers and sisters are actually getting richer off the struggles of the poor. And not only is all that really bad, horrific actually, but the situation that the Jewish people were in was, was bound to make God's covenant community look bad and bound to bring disrepute to the name of God. Wait, these are the people of the God of, God of Israel? Like, he can't take care of his own people? One of the things we've seen in virtually every chapter is that what motivates Nehemiah is a passion for God's glory. In fact, he says in verse 9, I'll, I'll get to in just a minute, but he says, the thing that you are, not, or you are doing is not good. 
Ought you not to walk in the fear of our God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? So this, all this creates a crisis. And, and here, here's what's going on. This is our first point. Division and oppression from within threaten the well-being and the witness of God's people. So in the church today, and of course we see this, there are a number of things that threaten the unity of the church. There's, of course, you know, political disagreements. Um, there's racial disunity when we don't honor one another of different uh, racial and ethnic backgrounds. There is, we might even say, we could say um, maturity disunity. That is to say, the weaker brother angry and resentful toward the stronger brother, the stronger brother looking down on and mocking the weaker. So there's that, and that's certainly a part. Um, there's theological, there can be theological disunity, which is one reason why as a church we really fight for theological unity, and, and as we should. But sometimes you get a theological, and this, of course, was the case in the early church, right? I mean, so many of those situations, so many of the letters of the New Testament are written to address uh, doctrinal impurity, false teaching, heresy. So, so there are all things, all kinds of things that threaten the unity of the church or can threaten the unity of the church. But maybe nothing that can tear apart a, a church more quickly than, ex, than the extreme disparity in wealth and income. That is, having people in the church who are rich and enjoy the finest benefits of, of life, while at the same time, having folks who are so poor that they can't even provide for their own families. And it's divisive because the extremely poor look at the extremely rich and they say, wait a second. I mean, aren't we brothers and sisters in Christ? Aren't we part of the same family? And yet you live so lavishly and we can't even provide. I mean, look, there's nothing wrong with wealth. There's nothing inherently wrong with wealth. We see in the Old Testament, we see in the New Testament, God blesses people with wealth. So that's, that's not the issue. The issue is those who have wealth who are ignoring and neglecting and actually, of course, in the case of Nehemiah, taking advantage of those who are poor. Now, I see this disparity every time I go to South Africa. There was a stretch of about 12 years where every even year, I was part of a board there. So every evening year I went to South Africa, every odd year the, our board meetings were held in Chicago land. But I would go there and you, in South Africa, you have some of the most extreme opulence you can imagine. I mean, these incredible mansions, you know, set up on a hill, perfect views, you know, 10, 12, 15,000 square feet. And then you have some of the worst, most devastating poverty you, you can imagine. There was, a, there was a little lady that I used to visit with a, a group of folks I was a part of. Her name was Dora. And we would go visit her, and she literally lived in a tin shack, falling apart, held together tenuously by cables and wire. I mean, it's unbelievable stuff. So there's this huge disparity, and as a result, there's great tension even in the church. I've had a chance to preach at some churches there in South Africa, and there's, there's a great deal of tension, and in some cases, animosity. Because the poor are saying, look, are we not part of the same family? And yet, I have to bury my own children. This is not a hyperbole. Because not a lot of it was because of the AIDS pandemic. But bury my own children because of a variety of things. Sometimes because of starvation. And yet you live so lavishly. So that's kind of what was going on in, that Nehemiah will address. You say, well, how does that apply to us in 21st century North America? You know, of course, one of the wealthiest countries in the world. I think it applies in two ways. First, we ought to be deeply concerned about those who are struggling, uh, those who are the disenfranchised, the underserved, the marginalized, the poor. Um, and we ought to be willing to make sacrifices, especially to see those in our church family that they're cared for. And, and by God's grace, we do that here. We have a benevolence fund and we, we use it and we help pay for medical bills and apartment bills and different things, and as we should, and it's all part of your faithfulness to give that we're able to do that. Um, now, of course, it doesn't mean that, you know, there won't be some people who are richer than others. Of course, there will always be that. It, that will always be the case. Um, but we ought to be willing to do with less 
if it, if it means that it's, we're able to help someone else who's in need. So that's one, I think, application. But I think more broadly, we can apply it this way, whatever it is. So whatever it is that threatens to drive a wedge between us as siblings in Christ and hinder our witness, whether it's financial disparity, political disagreement, um, differences in our preferences or spiritual maturity, those differences need to be humbly addressed so that the church's witness is not hindered. So that the surrounding nations, or in, in, in our case, to make it more specific, so that the ra- surrounding communities do not then disregard God because of what's happening among God's people. So when Nehemiah hears about all this, look at how he responds, verses 6 and 7. I was very angry when I heard their outcry and these words. I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and officials and I said to them, you are exacting interest, each from his brother, and I held a great assembly against them. Now we'll get to what he said in just a a moment, but the thought that a Jew could act like this to a fellow Jew, someone within the same covenant community, was absolutely... uh, aberrant uh, to Nehemiah, and he was literally enraged. He was enraged. One of the things I love about Nehemiah is, um, is how feisty he is as a person. We see that, you know, early in the earlier, in fact, chapter one, he's told about what's happening in Jerusalem, and he wept for days. He wept for days. We're going to see in chapter 13 in a few weeks that he gets so mad at some guys that he, he starts pulling their hair out literally, uh, because they married women from other nations uh, who were idol worshipers, and those women then seduced uh, God's people to worship other gods along with him. So Nehemiah is kind of a feisty dude, and he's, and he's really enraged by all this. And, but I mean, I think there's something, I think, to appreciate about the straightforwardness, isn't there? When I, before God called me to pastoral ministry, and many of you have heard some of my stories, but I worked as a, a sports reporter and then an anchor, a television anchor for a while, and when I was a reporter uh, with NBC for a while, I covered the Ohio teams, uh, Ohio State, Buckeyes, Cincinnati Reds, Cincinnati Bengals, and the biggest responsibility because this, the season so long was to go cover the Reds. So I would go down and I would interview guys, you know, after the games. And, and you know, you get this, I get the same old stuff, you know. It is what it is, you know, one day at a time, here to help the team, you know, all boring stuff. But there were some guys that I could really count on that I knew they would be straightforward with me. There was a, I was there, I was covering the Reds when they hired a guy as a manager by the name of uh, Jack McKee, and they called him Trader Jack because kind of his freewheeling spirit and freewheeling ways. And I had kind of a love-hate relationship with Trader Jack McKee, and I kind of hated to go interview him because he would always make us crowd into his office, and he would, and this is the, you know, this is mid to late 90s, and he would light up a cigar and he was just irascible enough that he would kind of, he would intentionally blow smoke. I don't mean this figuratively. I mean, literally blow smoke in the faces of the reporters. He just, you know, he was, an, he was one of the oldest managers at the time. Um, but what I loved about him is he just, he, he didn't think through like, what's the correct, you know, answer here. And so I would say, you know, to ask him about the game and his team's performance, I'm going to clean it up for you. But he would say, you know, he would say, we stunk. I stunk. I should be fired. We should all be fired. And he would go on this, this rant. Um, but you know, the thing I really appreciate about him and his players, he actually was uh, one of the old, oldest managers in the history of baseball and baseball has a, has a long history to win a world series, like in his seventies. Uh, but he was very straightforward and he was, he was real, you know, just a real person. Well, as we read this book in Nehemiah, we see that Nehemiah is a real dude. I mean, his emotions are real, he's raw, and he's, he gets pretty steamed about some things. Um, well, here, when he hears about the mistreatment of his people by their fellow Jews, the text tells us he becomes very angry or enraged. Points us, I think, to another area where we see division in the church, and that really has to do with the church's response to injustice. Uh, you know, just the phrase, social justice, can separate uh, Christian friends. You have those on the side of uh, social justice um, who, who say, 
um, you know, look, you call yourself a Christian, but you don't even care about the least of these, what God calls about, cares about. And then there are those who, um, who say to the so-called social justice warriors, you know, you've lost the gospel. And in many cases, both of those critiques are accurate and fair. Even though social justice is a loaded term, the Christian must care about justice. Must care about justice. Because God deeply cares about justice for the oppressed, the marginalized, the underserved, the neglected. And we want to be a church that deeply cares about the things that God cares about. That's why we partner with so many ministries to reach the marginalized and the underserved. Because we want to be a church that cares about people who, who are struggling and who are in need. And we don't want to just care about them from a distant distance. We want to be active. Nehemiah was active. If there's a reason to be angry, it's certainly one reason would be division and oppression within the church, within God's people. So Nehemiah is upset, but notice he's not just upset. After he becomes very angry, he says in verse 7, I took counsel with myself. Now that's kind of a weird phrase, isn't it? I got, if someone said to me, they came to me and they were having a hard time making a decision, they said, I took counsel with myself. I'd say, you need to broaden the circle a little bit. I mean, that, that, that's not enough. You know, you, you need to get some other people involved here. Or I might say, if I were in a particularly bad mood, I might say, you need some help. Because that's, that sounds really weird. Um, well, what Nehemiah, Nehemiah means there with this kind of odd phrase, again, in Old Testament written in Hebrew. And so, you know, there's a, there's a task of not just translating, but understanding Hebrew idiom. And what he's really saying there is, I, con I contemplated the matter carefully in order to rightly channel my anger. That's what he's saying. When he says, I took counsel, myself, he's saying, I really spent some time thinking about it, meditating, contemplating, so that I could channel my anger correctly. You know, anger itself is not always wrong. And I think sometimes as Christians, we might need to be more angry about some of the injustices that we see in the world. I know it's true of me. What do we do? What we do with our anger is often wrong, and, and why we get angry is, is often wrong. But anger itself is not a sin. After all, God gets angry. Now, in a different way, certainly. Well, after taking counsel with himself, Nehemiah brought charges against the nobles and officials, those who were allowing people to exact interest from their siblings. Now, look at verses 8 through 10. And I said to them, we, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who had been sold to the nations. But you even sell your brothers that they may be sold to us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. So I said, the thing that you are doing is not good. Ought you not to walk in the fear of God to prevent the taunts of the nations, our enemies? Moreover, I and my brothers and my servants are lending them money and grain. Let us abandon this exacting of interest. So, you know, there's a lot in there, but I, really what stood out to me, I think is most fascinating, is that Nehemiah doesn't immediately resort to reciting a law to these people. Now, he could have. There are lots of specific laws in the Old Testament about a charging interest to a needy brother. Let's go back and read uh, the book of Le Leviticus, especially the chapters in the 20s. There's plenty to say that's, that the Bible condemns exacting interest, charging interest to needy brothers and sisters. So it's, again, expressly condemned in the scriptures, but Nehemiah doesn't refer to that. Um, what Nehemiah does instead is he reminds God's people of what's been done. He says, we, as far as we are able, have bought back our Jewish brothers who've been sold to the nations. Now, when he says, as far as we're able, he's, he's, not, he's not saying we have done this. A better way to understand it is he's really saying, as we have been enabled to by God. In other words, he reminds them 
of the redemption that they have enjoyed by human hands, certainly on some level, but ultimately by the sovereign hand of God. And then he says, since that's the case, since you have been redeemed, since you have been bought free from slavery, since you have been rescued from your plight, ought you not to walk in the reverence of God in light of what you've received, in light of the way you've been redeemed? When an old-time scholar, Old Testament scholar H.G. Williamson says, in amplifying his charge, Nehemiah first points out the moral absurdity of what's been going on. Nehemiah says, how can you, someone who's been redeemed from slavery, someone who was captured and enslaved and been freed, how can then you turn around and enslave someone else? It's absolutely morally absurd. It's completely unreasonable. It makes no sense whatsoever. You've been treated with mercy, he says, by the hand of God. How foolish that you would now treat your brothers and sisters with such contempt. Now, here's the appeal. This is our second point. A proper understanding of how we've been redeemed must lead to a deep and genuine concern for those in need. If I can say it a different way, if we don't care about people in need, we don't understand how we've been redeemed. If we don't care about the least of these, which, you know, Jesus' brother James says is really the truest form of religion. If we don't care about the least of these, it must be because we don't understand our own redemption. Now, what I love about that is, is Nehemiah doesn't go to law immediately. There's, there's, there's some law in Nehemiah. We'll get to it. But he doesn't go immediately to law because he realizes that law doesn't motivate people to sustained obedience. And when I talk about law, I'm just talking about all the commands of God. The law tells us what to do, you know, all the commands in Scripture. But the law doesn't give us the power to do what it commands. Now, we see this, of course. If you're a parent, you, you, you say to one of your children, you could say, start loving your sister more. That's a command. Now, they may say to you, your kids are really respectful and obedient, so they're going to say, okay, sure, absolutely. But they're probably not going to be, they're definitely not going to be any better able to love their sister because you have demanded it. We could say to our teenage son, put away youthful lust. Do you not realize this is a command of God? He'll probably say to you, fine, yeah, I'll do that. But he's not going to be any better able to put away youthful lust just because you have told him what to do. We were never given the law to make us good. We were given the law so that we could see how much we need a savior and to see how far God went to save us. The law was meant to point us to Christ to make us dependent on and grateful for Christ's obedience for us when we have failed. Now, this is not to say we don't need the law. Of course we do. The law tells us how we are to live. The law tells us what we are to do. And one of the things the law makes clear here is as a Christian, we don't have a right to be indifferent toward those who are in need. Paul says in Galatians 6, so then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. Same apostle says in Romans 12, contribute to the needs of the saints and to show hospitality. We saw when we studied the book of Romans, how the earliest Christian churches responded to the needs of their fellow believers. They made tremendous sacrifices with urgency and generosity. This is the biblical prescription. This is what the law tells us to do. Yes, we must obey it. But what will motivate us to obey the law, to sacrifice and to give and to care for those who are in need? Will it be more commands? It's doubtful. 
but instead more reminders of God's redemptive work on our behalf. See, if you're a Christian, just like the Jewish people who we're talking about here 2,500 years ago, you were, you have been miraculously delivered from slavery. If you're a Christian, you were born into slavery to sin. You were born with a sin nature, powerless to worship God and do works that please him. For your whole life, you were enslaved to sin and death and the law. And because of that, the law, which demands perfection, stood over you like a merciless judge, condemning you to hell, saying, you didn't do that. 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 You did that, which you shouldn't have. You did that, which you shouldn't have. And so on the law goes. But if you've trusted in Jesus, you have been freed from that enslavement. You've been given a new nature, which now is actually able to worship God, which now actually delights in pleasing God. And now you're able to do in Christ works that bring God pleasure. And along with that, you've been given the most incredible gift that anyone has ever received. And that is the fully sufficient imputed righteousness of Jesus. In other words, the perfectly obedient life of Jesus, who never failed the law in any way, but always obeyed the law entirely, is now considered your life by God. God considers Jesus' obedient life your life. And his penalty-paying death is now considered your death, which means that your sin no longer hangs over you. You've been completely forgiven for every time you've lashed out in anger, every time you've disrespected your husband or belittled your wife, every time you've badmouthed your boss, Every time you've wasted time at work, backstabbed a coworker, let loose with a profane rant, lingered over that explicit picture, spread that morsel, that morsel of gossip, committed that sexual sin, it's all covered. It's all covered. And not because of anything you've done, not because of anything that I've done, all those same sins are covered for me too, but only because of the work of Jesus Christ. In fact, our sins are covered, we can even fairly say theologically, in spite of everything we've done. When we were rebellious, God rescued us from our slavery. He loved us. He redeemed us. He purchased us with Christ's own blood, and he made us clean. He made us clean. Now, there's so many images in the Bible that speak to this. The prostitute is made a bride. The adulterer is given a clean slate. The dead are raised. The unrighteous are declared righteous. Slaves are made to be sons. The blind given back their sight. The sick made whole. The unclean are made pure. The guilty are forgiven. And so on the list goes. If you've trusted in Jesus, you have been freed from your slavery to sin and death and the law. So the law can no longer accuse you all those things I said the law said you didn't do and you, did, you, you didn't do that you should have, the law has nothing to say against you. In fact, I love what Martin Luther says so beautifully. He says, when the law comes and accuses you of having not kept it, bid it to go to Christ. Say, there is the man who has kept it. To him I cling. He fulfilled it for me and gave his fulfillment to me. Thus the law is silenced. So the law... All the commands of God, they no longer hang over you. They no longer condemn you because of the work of Christ. This is all because of the grace of God. So the, the more that we focus on that redemption we've received, the more that we revel in the love of God for us in Christ, the more that we rest in this new status that we have, uh, the more we actually become concerned about those who are remain enslaved to sin and those who are suffering by all kinds of other uh, needs. So let's look at the final section where Nehemiah provides uh, a uh, personal example. 
He says, moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year to the 32nd year of Artaxerxes the king, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allowance of the governor. The former governors who were before me laid heavy burdens on the people and took from them their daily ration, 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants lorded it over the people, but I did not do so because of the fear of God. I also persevered in the work of this wall, and we acquired no land, and all my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 men, Jews and officials, besides those who came to us from the nations that were around us. Now what was prepared at my expense for each day was one ox and six choice sheep and birds, and every 10 days all kinds of wine in abundance. Yet for all this, I did not demand the food allowance of the governor because the service was too heavy on this people. Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I've done for this people. So very quickly, there was a time before Nehemiah became governor that others in key leadership roles, they used their respective positions to abuse, uh, to exhaust, and to deplete the people they served. But Nehemiah says, look, I never did this. You can't hold that against me because I never did. In fact, even though the custom of that day required the governor to entertain people at his table, so that, that sort of hospitality was actually required, Nehemiah says, look, there were 100 people, 150 people at my table, but not one person was fed at your expense. I paid for all the food. I even chose not to accept a food allowance from the governor. In other words, Nehemiah was practicing what he preached. He implored the people to be generous and sacrificial and to care for their brothers, and he was modeling this beautifully. He didn't have to, but he desired to because he says he recognized the heavy burden on his people and he was motivated by his own redemption and the fear of the Lord. Here's our final point this morning. A reverence for God and a recognition of his grace provide the strength to resist the cultural norms of selfish advancement at the expense of others. So when we understand what we've been forgiven and when we recognize all that we've received, when we grasp the slavery from which we've been freed, all of that, of course, causes us to revere God even more to praise him more joyfully and to care about those who are in need. Everywhere we turn, of course, we're told we should have it all. Why? Because we deserve it all. We should have every single thing we want. That's the American dream, isn't it? To work hard, have everything we want, to move up and so on. And yet Christ offers a very different perspective. He says the first will become last and the last first. He says, if you want to save your life, you have to give it up. The real great ones are not those who are being served, but those who are served by others. Jesus says the rich will not inherit the kingdom. So in essence, you need to limit what you have. Now, these are all hard commands. But again, where do we get the strength to resist the lure of our culture, which says more, more, more? It's the tyranny of the more. Well, it's on the same basis that Nehemiah did. It's a recognition of the redemption that we've enjoyed by God. And it is a fear of God that leads us to respond to him with worship and to respond to one another with love and compassion. When we start to realize where we've come from, our own sinfulness, our own enslavement, and what God has done to buy us back to himself, to free us from the slavery to sin and death, it becomes only reasonable for us to obey God's commands out of joy, to love him and to give everything we have to serve those around us. Let's pray.